Uh, windier than heck out right now and I am at a place that has probably been recommended to me more than any other place since I've had this channel and that is right here at the National World War One Museum and Memorial uh, so this is a museum that I would I've, I've been to it a long time ago but I haven't been here in probably four or five years uh, really uh, an amazing uh, museum they have all kinds of cool stuff and uh, they also have some things that they've added since I've been here that we are going to check out today that I am super excited about so anyway we're gonna get out of the wind and get into the museum and see what we can learn So we just got into the museum here and got our tickets. And uh, the first thing whenever you get in here is you walk across this bridge over a, uh, a field of, of poppies. So the poppy is kind of like a symbolic flower of remembrance for World War I. Uh, the, the soldiers who would have been like in Belgium and around in Flanders would have seen uh, these, these poppies all over the place. And it really struck a uh, Canadian surgeon by the name of John McRae, who wrote a poem called In Flanders Fields. All right, we're gonna go ahead and head on in. All right, um, one quick thing before we continue on through the museum. Uh, there, there's something here that I'm super pumped about that we're gonna be doing a, a little bit later uh, called War Remains. Uh, there was an interview that I did with uh, history podcaster Dan Carlin a couple of years ago and, and we talked about this like immersive World War I VR experience. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're gonna go ahead and go through the museum first and then, uh, yeah, take a look at this uh, War Remains thing. So whenever you come into this museum, well, they start in the same place that any good story should start, at the beginning. Uh, so here they're, they're kind of laying out the foundations of World War One. So for example, right here, they're talking about uh, militarism and, and the arms race that took place between the European nations. Uh, so for example, like the, the British had built this insane battleship called uh, the HMS Dreadnought that essentially made all other battleships on the planet obsolete. So all of the other countries, especially Germany, started rushing to build their own fleet of dreadnoughts uh, to keep up. And then as you progress around, well, it talks about some of the other uh, reasons for the start of World War I, like imperialism, everybody rushing to try and establish colonies. Uh, and then it also talks about, you know, economics and society, okay? It's just really, really incredible uh, what they've done here. Here they're, they're talking about one of the real big reasons for the start of World War I is the entangling alliances. So here at this museum, to my knowledge, this is the only World War I museum in the world that fully interprets the war. It's not just the American experience. You're, you're getting the whole thing right here. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on and uh, see what we can learn. Here's another cool artifact before we move on that people may or may not know about. This is a uh, stereoscope viewer. So people may think that 3D is something more modern. Well, it's actually been around for quite a while. They would take two images and uh, then you could adjust the focal length and uh, it would give you kind of a, a 3D picture. So again, as I was mentioning, 
whenever you come here, you're getting the full story of World War I. And whenever I say the full story, I mean it. Uh, so you could spend as much time here as you wanted looking at really kind of a play-by-play -play of the war as it unfolded. Uh, so here we have a, a timeline starting in 1914. Uh, with you know, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Gavrilo Princip, and then moving up through 1916. So this area right here, the, the Americans aren't really even involved yet. Um, you know, there, there are some people who are expressing support back home or they're expressing opposition, but as far as military involvement, this is all Europe in this section. For anyone who is wanting to learn more about the First World War but doesn't really have uh, a working knowledge of the, the history of it, they do a really good job here interpreting what happened. So one of the big things that led to this global conflict was the alliance system. So you have all of these entangling alliances and they really have a good graphic that shows like the order of how things went. So Austria-Hungary uh, declares war on Serbia after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And then whenever Russia mobilized its troops, well, Austria-Hungary and Germany were in an alliance. So Germany declares war on Russia, uh, and then Germany declares war on France uh, because of the alliance that they had, and then they invade Belgium. And, and this really does a good job of helping to kind of visualize and understand how Europe got pulled into this awful mess. Here they show some of the gear that the soldiers who fought in World War I would have went into war with. Uh, so the, the way that people march into war in 1914 is going to be completely different than the way they march out in 1918. So you can see uh, like these, these uh, British and Japanese swords. Um, there's a, a German uniform back there. The, the helmet is really where we see a whole lot of changes. So you have these, these spiked helmets with like these horsehair uh, decorations or like these skulls and things like that. Uh, well, when uh, artillery starts falling, that's all going to get traded in for steel helmets. One of the things that really typifies trench warfare is the presence of barbed wire as a defensive measure. And this was, this was kind of an improvisation. Barbed wire was invented in 1874 by a guy named Joseph Glidden. He was an Illinois farmer. So it, its original purpose was for livestock. And uh, the French started acquiring barbed wire from local farmers and putting it up in like these awful looking bird's nests uh, to try and uh, defend themselves against any uh, German attack, you know, uh, across no man's land. And here they have a few other things, uh, like these stakes right here were nicknamed pigtails. So you would screw that into the ground and then string up your barbed wire in between them. And then they have all kinds of tools here that you would use to, uh, you know, cut the barbed wire. They even have a real interesting thing that rigged up on the end of your rifle to where you could snip this barbed wire and move on through. So with everybody burrowed down in the trenches, one of the, the big dangers to soldiers was being sniped. Uh, so here you see a uh, German sniper rifle and they started coming up with all of these different ways to try and uh, protect themselves. Uh, so here you can see like some of these uh, trench periscopes where you wouldn't have to stick your head up above the, uh, the trench. And uh, then they also have like these trench shields. So this is a German uh, trench shield right here. And then they also had it rigged up to where you could put it on your rifle. But uh, yeah, just absolute terror and misery there on the on the trench lines of World War One. What we're looking at here is a uh, Russian Maxim model 1910 machine gun uh, would have had a uh, 7.62 rifle cartridge that would have been belt fed and the, the original machine guns 
were water cooled. So, so this tube that you see right here would have had water in it to keep the barrel from overheating and melting down because that would be kind of con inconvenient uh, in the middle of a battle. Uh, kind of a cool story, this particular machine gun saw service after World War I, uh, got reserviced by uh, the Soviets in 1932 and was captured by the Finnish army in 1940. Here they have uh, some more machine guns on display. Uh, so this right here is a, uh, a British Lewis gun, uh, model 1914. Uh, they also have, um, well, like this portable Hotchkiss light machine gun, uh, and also a uh, Vickers heavy machine gun. Again, we have a, a water-cooled barrel there, and these things just. It, you, you can imagine using old style tactics of these full frontal assaults and then meeting one of these things. Uh, it, it was just absolute carnage. Uh, and that's why we see in World War I higher losses than at any war previous. Uh, so here's a, a French Hotchkiss. I think, if I remember right, this one was a nightmare for the soldiers. It, it wasn't a very good one. But yeah, something else to see these old weapons. Well, you're really getting the, the full story of the war here at this museum, not just the, the military side. So here, this section is talking about refugees and forced labor during the war. Having uh, spent some time working with refugees in a war-torn area, uh, I, I really appreciate that they've done this. Well, I darn near walked by this thing and didn't even realize what I was looking at, uh, but fortunately I stopped. This is the model 1915 field jacket that belonged to a guy who you may have heard of. He was a general field marshal for the German army, and his name was Paul Ludwig Hans Anton von Beneckendorf und von Hindenburg, or as we might more commonly know him, uh, Paul von Hindenburg. This is a guy who was the hero of the Battle of Tannenberg on the Eastern Front and uh, really became an icon for the German people. And they also have his field cap here for officers. And if we get down just a little bit, maybe we can zoom in. And if you look, you'll see inside of the sweatband, the initials VH for von Hindenburg. That is cool as heck that they have this here. In World War I, naval warfare isn't really much of a factor, especially whenever you compare it to World War I. Uh, but there, there was a little bit that was going on. One big naval battle was the Battle of Jutland. What we're looking at here is a model of a German U-boat. Okay, now submarine technology wasn't new. Uh, there had already been some dabblings with it earlier but the Germans really perfected and brought it to bear in World War I. Now look at this. So the British had set up a blockade of Germany in the North Sea, and the Germans retaliated by really bringing their submarines into play, and each one of those red dots represents a British merchant ship that was torpedoed and sent to the bottom of the ocean by German submarines. By 1917, uh, German U-boats had destroyed 30% of the world's merchant ships. That is crazy. So they, they were trying to starve the British out, um, and the British with their blockade were trying to starve the Germans out, uh, and really it was just going to be a race to see uh, who would break the other first. But man, that really drives home the role of the U-boats in World War I. In World War I, we are going to see aviation used in combat for the very first time. Now, the, the airplane was fairly new. It had only been invented by the Wright brothers in 1903. And at first, they used airplanes for reconnaissance. And then somebody got the idea that maybe they should start taking some weapons up there and shooting at the other side. So here you can see uh, some uh, machine guns and some other uh, artifacts that are associated with aviation. You also have blimps 
uh, that are being used or zeppelins or dirigibles. Uh, there was actually a, a bombing of England that the, the Germans had. You typically think of that during the Blitz in World War II, but it happened in World War I as well. And then here they have on display some different flying aces. Uh, guys like Manfred von Richthofen, who had uh, 80 victories, and then some others that you might be less familiar with. Oh, but you might be familiar with that guy. Uh, stick around, he is going to play a role in the sequel. Now, as the war was uh, raging in Europe, uh, most Americans were pretty dedicated to staying out of the war and remaining neutral. As a matter of fact, Wilson got reelected in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of war. Then some things started changing. Uh, there, there had already been an incident with a British passenger liner called the Lusitania. It had been torpedoed uh, by the Germans because they suspected it of carrying war materials, which it actually was, uh, but, but the, that killed some Americans. And then in January of 1917, uh, the Germans sent a telegram called the Zimmerman Note or the Zimmerman Telegram to Mexico proposing an alliance. If the U.S. would get involved, the U.S. really didn't like that. And then shortly thereafter, uh, they announced an unrestricted sub campaign where they were going to sink any ships uh, that they saw in, in British waters. Um, so that included U.S. ships. And uh, that was kind of the final straw for a lot of the American people. And in April of 1917, uh, the U.S. declared war on Germany. This is really interesting. So here we see uh, this little like portable cardboard cutout thing uh, that was used by the Red Cross uh, for uh, you know setting up volunteer stations or uh, encouraging people to give uh, or to buy war bonds. But this right here is what I found the most interesting. This is the flag that flew over the U.S. Capitol on April 2nd 1917 when President Wilson uh, delivered his war message to a joint session of Congress. That is really cool. Now after the US declared war on Germany, uh, to be honest we weren't quite ready. Uh, we had a, a really small army and also didn't have the gear. So manufacturing in the United States had to go into overdrive. Uh, so here you can see like some of these wool leggings uh, that were created and uh, shoes there in the background. Okay, we had to make uh, uniforms for short people. Um, and then if you go along here, here are some overseas caps and great coats and uh, uniform pieces. So, so the textile industry and the manufacturing in the United States really kicked into gear during this period of time. And this is pretty cool. These are uh, ID badges for the workers at a uh, manufacturing company in New Jersey. By the way, uh, those who have absolutely uh, no sense of humor, yes, I realize that this is a child's uniform and not one for short people. As a matter of fact, they actually have a picture of uh, the child with this uniform, which is really pretty cool. Here's something that is quite iconic that came out of World War I. This is a recruiting poster that was made by James Montgomery Flagg with uh, Uncle Sam on there saying, I want you for the U.S. Army. Uh, now, Flagg made you know, several um, you know, propaganda posters and recruitment posters, but, but this is the one that has really become iconic. And they, they have a lot of these posters here. Pretty cool.
what we're looking at here is a US three inch field gun. Uh, so this is an artillery piece that they would have trained with uh, here in the United States. And it's a little bit deceptive. You, you might look at these seats and think that this is where they sat when they fired it. That would uh, n not be comfortable. Uh, this is just for whenever they uh, would be moving the piece from one uh, place to another. Um, but right here under the footrests, there are some emergency tubes for ammunition. Uh, most of the ammunition will be carried in a separate case on. But the guys who were operating this gun would actually set back here. Uh, so you would have one person who would uh, adjust the elevation and another person uh, would adjust the traversing from right to left. And there were three different pieces of artillery that it could fire. Uh, there was just a, a common steel shell, um, there was common shrapnel, and then also uh, high explosive shrapnel or HE rounds. So I was just talking about with that three inch gun how the ammunition would have been carried uh, on a, a caisson, a caisson limber. And here at the museum they have an example of that which I really appreciate because it helps us to kind of understand things a, a little bit better. So you can see there where the ammunition would have been stored as well as back here and uh, they show it being drawn by four horses. Uh, in, in World War I they, they typically would have had six horses or mules that were that were pulling these caissons. But it's interesting to think how we came into World War I with horses and mules and went out with planes and tanks. I mentioned how the U.S. went into World War I rather unprepared and uh, this really illustrates that point well. So here uh, on, on the left hand side uh, you can see a Canadian Ross rifle. This would have been a 303 caliber. And then this right here is what the U.S. is going into training with. We had wooden rifles uh, because there weren't enough real rifles to outfit all of the troops. So uh, again, U.S. manufacturing was really going to have to kick it into high gear uh, in order to meet the demands of the war. Whenever we are talking about World War I, uh, we can't ignore the service of the women on the Western Front. Uh, so there were about 25,000 women who served overseas as nurses or drivers or secretaries um, and doctors. Okay, so they filled a, a lot of roles that were vital to the operations on the Western Front. What we're looking at here is the uniform of a woman named Grace Banker who was a telephone operator. And something that's really cool is they also have her painted helmet here. That is really awesome. In World War I, we are also going to see a changing role for African Americans. So here we're looking at a tunic from a guy who was a, uh, a medic or in the medical corps of the 92nd Infantry Division. And they adopted the, the buffalo as their uh, insignia. Now, a lot of people say that these guys were, were buffalo soldiers. Uh, while they used the buffalo insignia, uh, the, the buffalo soldiers were from the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry in, uh, in the West. Here we can see a yard-long photo of one of these African-American units in World War I. And here is another tunic from an outfit that you may not be familiar with. Uh, you can see on the shoulder patch there, there's a, a coiled rattlesnake. Uh, this is an infantry tunic from somebody who would have been in the 369th Infantry Regiment of the 93rd Division. Uh, and they were nicknamed the Black Rattlers. Now, if you look up there, that is not a U.S. helmet. That is a French helmet. Uh, so as the war was dragging on, the, the French were basically begging General Pershing for reinforcements, and he reluctantly uh, gave them some U.S. units, even though uh, Wilson had asked him to keep the U.S. as a separate fighting force. Well, the, the Black Rattlers was one of those groups that went over and fought 
under the French. And uh, there were a couple of guys who became the first African Americans to get the, uh, the French Croix de Guerre. Uh, one of them, the first one, was a guy named Henry Johnson, so you can look him up. And then there was another one named uh, Needham Roberts. Very cool that they have this here. I mentioned how the soldiers of World War I uh, came in on horses and mules and left in planes and tanks. Uh, what we're looking at here is a U.S. model 1917 tank. That is incredible that they have this thing here. Uh, th this was modeled, it was really an exact copy of the, the French Renault um, and was uh, developed basically to break the, the stalemate of trench warfare. But uh, yeah, pretty cool to see some of the early designs, early models of tank, uh, and to think about what it was and, and then what it became. Uh, it's pretty incredible. And they also have a uh, flag that flew at General John J. Pershing's headquarters here. Pretty awesome. So this is pretty cool. This is the service tunic of a guy by the name of uh, John Montgomery, who was in a unit that was attached to the, uh, the French Tank Corps. Uh, but here's something that I didn't know existed, but is really interesting. Uh, these are splinter goggles. Uh, and these would have been worn by tankers uh, to protect them against uh, splinter and, and bullet splash that was coming in through the narrow eye slits that they had to look through on those tanks. And that thing is medieval looking. It was made by the British, uh, so that I guess maybe that explains a little bit. But that is cool as heck. Always learning something new. What we have here is kind of the, the full combat uniform and equipment that a U.S. soldier would have had during World War I. Uh, so, of course, there's his, his wool tunic and pants. Uh, we have a gas mask bag right here. Uh, and also this wicked-looking trench knife. Um, and then also, you know, of course, the helmet and the O3 Springfield. So that's kind of the, the kit and gear that a, uh, a World War I soldier would have had for the U.S. Army. Here's a better look at some of these trench knives, and I have always found these things to just be insidious looking. It's crazy. Uh, all of the creative ways that people were coming up with to, to maim and kill each other. So these trench knives would have uh, like brass knuckle attachments, and then if you look up here on top, you see that little uh, pommel projection coming out there. That, that was called a, uh, a skull crusher. And and then if you look at the scabbard here, one model of trench knife had a uh, triangular shaped blade. So all kinds of terrible weapons for hand-to-hand -hand combat to uh, make the experience all the more unpleasant. Here are some more artillery pieces that they have here at the museum. Uh, this is a US 120 millimeter field gun. Um, and then right next to it, it's this little guy here. Uh, this is a French uh, 37 millimeter semi-automatic gun uh, along with the, uh, the carriage. Uh, I've never seen one of those before. That's pretty cool. But the one thing about World War I that I've always found uh, just fascinating, I guess you could say, at least when it comes to artillery, are the trench mortars. Okay, so this is a 240 millimeter heavy trench mortar. I mean, this thing just looks like a beast. Just look at the, the base there. Uh, now, there, there were four different types of fire action that the trench mortars uh, would have. Uh, there would be a barrage where they would fire like eight to 10 rounds per minute uh, to put down like a, a curtain of fire for the advancing troops. Uh, another type was, um, was an, an annihilating fire action where they're directing fire towards an enemy or uh, where they are at least supposed to be. Uh, there was also destructive, where they might be trying to take out 
like a, a barracks or an observation post or uh, another machine gun or mortar position and then also harassing fire where they're trying to disrupt the movement of the enemy. But yeah, the old, the old trench mortar. Something else. And here's something that they have here that really drives home the cost of war. Uh, we're looking at a picture of 2nd Lieutenant Henry Hillary, uh, who was in the Royal Field Artillery. And he was wounded and killed on June 2nd, 1917. And they have here his temporary grave marker. He is uh, buried in France, uh, but the family, at the request, could uh, acquire the temporary marker um, whenever they put a, a permanent one up. Okay, so uh, now that we've made our way through the museum, uh, we're gonna go ahead and go take a look at uh, one of the, the main reasons why I wanted to come here today, and that is the War Remains uh, immersive experience. Uh, so like I said earlier, I, I talked to Dan Carlin about this, um, you know, shortly after it came out and told him that, uh, you know, this, he, he's not in charge of it, but I said this thing really needs to come to the World War I Museum. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and uh, Go see what we got. Okay, just got up here uh, to the top floor where they have the War Remains exhibit set up. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, this is this is narrated by Dan Carlin, who is. Uh, you know, by far one of my favorite history podcasters. All right, go ahead and uh, turn in our tickets and, and uh, get going with this thing. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea of how uh, intense this War Remains experience is, uh, I have to fill out a waiver uh, before I can even uh, go into this thing. Okay, uh, well, we, we just got our, our waiver signed, and um, they, they have a thing in here where they're going to rig me up with, like, these uh, VR goggles and headset and everything like that. Uh, but anyway, getting ready to go through and uh, get, get a little taste of World War I through uh, the War Remains experience. Remember something. On the Western Front of the First World War, things can always get worse. They can always get much, much worse. Uh, okay, um, <laughs> that was wild. Um, if you are anywhere near where this War Remains thing is, you have to go through it. Uh, that, that is going to, this is like the first step in something that I think is really going to uh, change the way that we interact with and, and learn from history. Um, that was pretty crazy. Uh, I, I'm actually gonna go ahead and go back through it now and and show uh, just what it is that, that you're walking through as you're going through this experience. Okay, so here's just a, a quick walkthrough. Um, so as you are going through this thing, like you're, you're seeing everything that's happening in the trenches, but, but they also have this tactile element where you, you can reach out and, you know, like feel the environment uh, that's that's around you. So you're walking around on like these duck boards and uh, you know, you're interacting with you know, some of this equipment uh, just 
an absolutely wild experience. All right, well, there you go. That was uh, just a, a little bit of the World War I Museum right here in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, easily one of the best museums in the country. And I didn't even show a fraction of what they have in there. It's just overwhelming. Uh, now, we're not done with the World War I Museum. I'm actually gonna come back tomorrow and uh, while they're closed, we're gonna have an opportunity to take a look behind the scenes and uh, see what they have in the archives and uh, maybe get, get a little bit of a look behind the curtain from some of the curators right here at the National World War I Museum. We are constantly exploring and learning new things on this channel, so if you found value in this video, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell to catch all of the new content when it comes out. And be sure to check the links in the description for more content and opportunities from our partners.